Well, hello everyone and welcome to Island Baptist Church's worship service for today, for January the 10th. So glad that you've decided to join us and to listen to these messages, which we've been uh, putting onto YouTube. Uh, Wonders of technology are amazing, and you've got an opportunity to go back and listen to any messages that you've uh, missed over the holidays, or if you want to pick up with us, we're beginning our series again of Philippians. And if you've just been joining us recently, you can go back and catch up from the series where we were. Uh, We do hope to have some live streams up soon, but with the challenges of technology, we haven't been able to get it together quite yet uh, to have that up and running. In fact, this is the, the fourth recording I've had to try to make to get all the technology working today, but I'm glad that you've chosen to tune in. Also, let me encourage you, if you're able to tune in and join us on a Wednesday night on Hong Kong time, about 730, we have a meeting on Zoom and you can write to us at church or write to one of us and let us know you would like to have the uh, meeting codes and the passwords. That gives us a chance to see each other face to face or to hear your voice and to hear your prayer requests. And I hope you can join us that way. I mentioned some of our prayer requests in Sunday school. You can go back and watch that as well. But we do thank you for joining us, and we pray for the day that we can meet again together, not only live, but also face to face and in person. Let's pray and ask God to bless our time together now. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that we have gathered together today to hear from it, to read about the testimony of your dear servant, Paul. And Father, we thank you for your inspiration of him as he shared his life story and how he communicated to the Philippian believers. Father, today we ask that you would help us to imitate him as he sought to imitate your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for showing us and revealing to us your Son, Jesus Christ, and thus revealing yourself. Father, thank you for showing us your love and your mercy. Father, even though you are a holy God and a just God, a God of wrath against sin, who will punish those who resist you and who turn away from you, we thank you, Father, for the vision and the image of Christ, our Savior who came to die for us so that we could have everlasting life. And Father, I pray that if anyone is listening to the message today who has not admitted that they are a sinner, haven't confessed that to you and trusted in your son, Jesus Christ, that they would do that today. And Father, for those of us who are Christians, we would live this day and each day of the new year in a way that would please you. So Father, help us through the word today to be changed into the image of your dear son so that we can be pleasing in your sight. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we get back into our study of Philippians, I do want to show you uh, our new theme for the year. Now, this is a good chance for me to say as well, our new theme for Island Baptist Church in 2021 is being built up in Christ. You can see those words and the inspiration for those words from Colossians chapter 2, especially verses 6 and 7 are what we're going to focus on this year. And Lord willing, uh, as the months go on, we'll share some messages based on this theme. But also gives me a chance, as I was saying, to remind you I've sent out a a Bible reading plan. Um, Even though it's the 10th day of the year, we haven't gone very far into the 365 days. So you can pick up, and it's a topical reading program this year if you'd like to get started. Also, I want to thank my students who are in the class on Friday nights as they begin their reading for our wisdom series. If you're interested in that, we can tell you more about it as well. But we pray that this year God will allow us to be built up in his son, Jesus Christ. And today's message will fit into that theme as well. If you've got your Bibles, though, we're not going to be in Colossians. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Now, if you were with us before, you'll remember that in Philippians chapter 3, we had last shared the message on reckoning our rubbish. Paul had shown us a great example of how he was able to turn from the past and look to the future, as we'll see again today, but that how everything in our lives, whether that be things that we used to value or struggles that we've had, none of that is weighty or important. It all pales in comparison to what we have in Jesus Christ. Yes, God absolutely uses our past, but praise God. 
He is the one, the relationship we have with him through Jesus Christ that of a supreme value for us. Now, this passage I told you before many weeks ago when I talked about those lessons is one of my favorites in Philippians chapter 3. Now, some of you say, well, Pastor, you've said that about every chapter of Philippians, that it's one of your favorites. Well, that's true. I love the book of Philippians, but I love here because Paul is very, we can say, playful in the way he describes his condition and the way we ought to live. There's some very serious things here, but the way Paul says it is really in a beautifully interesting way to try and get us to understand what he wants us to know. In fact, the time of the lesson today is is taken from Paul as he says that we, Christians, and Paul are perfectly imperfect. And we say, what do you mean by that? Perfectly imperfect. Now, in English, when we use the word perfect, we also think of something that is just absolutely right. It could not be better It's absolutely 100% perfect. Couldn't be better. And when we think of something that's imperfect, we think of a situation or a thing that could be just a little better or it has some faults, it needs some improvement. And what I want is the same thing Paul wants. I want you and I want me to be perfectly and absolutely realize we are still yet imperfect. Okay, we'll see this as we go on today, but the subtitle helps you to understand it. It's our desire. It's Paul's desire. It's my desire. And I pray that it's your desire to grow in Christ. Now, although Paul is going to share uh, several ways in which we're to, to see this desire, he's also going to give something which is very powerful. He's going to give us some examples of people that we are to avoid. And just as inspiring as Paul's going to be in his writing about his own life, it's also challenging and sobering when we see these people who are re- living the wrong way. And they're so interesting and saddening. I've devoted the Sunday school lesson to some of their faults uh, from different chapters of the Bible. Let's go on to see, though, what Paul's good example is to you and to me and see what we mean by being perfectly imperfect. Now, the verses that we're going to begin with as we go through here, Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 21. I'll hide those verses for the screen. Uh, The first thing we see from Paul as we begin is found in verses 12 and 13. And there's a mature kind of immaturity. You can see we've still got this play on words here because for mature Christians, we realize we are not yet mature. You say, now wait a minute, Pastor, you just said something that doesn't make any sense. A mature person realizes that they're immature? Well, yes, you're going to understand this, uh, Lord willing, as we look into our Bibles here in chapter 3. Look down what Paul says, beginning in verse 12. Not as though I had already attained. He's saying, it's not as if I've already attained something. Well, what's he's talking about? Look at verse 11. We, we covered this the week before, uh, weeks before. It's as if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, Paul is saying he doesn't count himself. He doesn't act as if he had already attained. Now, is Paul assured of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Yes, absolutely. In fact, in Sunday school, I read some verses that prove that. Paul knows there is a resurrection and that the Lord uh, was resurrected from the grave and we too will be resurrected already. So what does he mean here when he says, not as though I had already attained, if he knows he's going to be resurrected in Jesus Christ? Either, verse 12 helps us to see it, either we're already perfect This is that word perfect, which again, I said is related to teleology or telos or achieving your end that you should have. He says, I I haven't already attained. I'm not already perfect. But instead, look at verse 12. But I follow after if that I may apprehend that which for, for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Do you see the beautiful play on word that he gives there? Okay. He says, I have not yet attained and I am not yet perfect. Paul is saying that even he, the great writer of so many uh, books in our Bible, so many portions of our scripture, did not act as if he was already perfect. He didn't act as if he had already attained and reached absolute spiritual maturity. But instead, he says, I am following after Christ. I want to apprehend him. I like the words in our Bible that end with this H-E-N-D. It's kind of like the word hand. 
You remember from John's gospel, I often say the Bible says the darkness did not uh, comprehend him uh, when Christ came. Comprehend is to surround and to grasp. Apprehend as well as to grasp and, and to get and to have and to hold. And so Paul is saying in, in a very creative way here, you look in verse 12 in English, he says, I want to apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ. Now, Christ has apprehended us, right? We are in him. He has us. And God has apprehended us, we might say, captured us and has us for a purpose. There are some things that God wanted Paul to do and me to do and you to do. And, and that's part of why he has us in his family as a child of God. But I have not yet, and Paul had not yet, apprehended fully all that God wanted him to do. Isn't that a beautiful and, again, a creative way to say it? I want to apprehend that for which I am apprehended. In other words, I'm following after Christ. I want to know all that he wants me to know and do all that he wants me to do because he has, has me for a reason here on this earth. So do you see what Paul has done? There's a mature kind of immaturity. Now already, Paul would challenge you, and I would too, if you think you're mature as a Christian, you ought to already recognize this. If you're growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Savior, you realize that there's still far, far more that you need to know. I've heard it said many times by my father, uh, Pastor Steve Johnson, would often say this, that those who were cro closest to the Lord in their walk with him would often feel the, the saddest about their sins, would often be the ones who could see most clearly how far yet they still needed to grow in Christ's likeness. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. There's a mature kind of immature. Paul goes on in verses 13 and 14 to talk again about his forgotten past and his forward look. That ties into our message where he says, I reckon all those things as rubbish, as trash, as refuse. Let's look down again at verse 13. He says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. I am not reckoning myself again as saying I've got it all. I've achieved it all. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What wonderful verses about the Christian journey, forgetting the past and all that lay behind him, both its successes and its failures and pressing forward to try and achieve that which God wanted him to do, focusing on the future, focusing on the future hope, focusing on the future reward, and going for this prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, friends, surely you will not be the kind of person who listens to these verses as a Christian and says, well, Paul had a high calling, but I don't. Paul was an apostle, but I'm not. No, listen, friends, every single one of you listening to this message today who is a Christian, you have a calling in Christ. There is something for which God has apprehended you for. And you are meant and called to do something for God. There is no greater and no higher calling than you doing what God put you on earth to do. Friends, what a wonderful reminder for us in the new year to put behind us the things of the past and to apprehend the things God has called you to do. Christians, don't waste and just float through your life, but instead pursue after what God wants you to do. God's got you here on earth for a reason. Search after it and find out for what it is and don't just float through life. By the way, in just a moment, we're going to see the sad and tragic alternative, which I say sadly for myself. Many times I have lived in this way, and I fear that many of us Christians live in this way. But let's see this here from Paul. Imitate Paul as he recognizes he still has far to go and he's putting his effort into it. Now, as we go from this, before we get to those bad examples, I really like what Paul does here with a clever conclusion. Notice carefully how Paul words this. He says in verse 15, Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. Now, wait a minute, you say. Didn't Paul say in verses 12 and 13, I'm not perfect yet? That's what he said. So he says here, let us therefore as many as be perfect and mature, be thus minded to think that you're not perfect. 
And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we've already attained, let us mind the same, uh, let us walk by the same rule and let us mind the same thing. Here's what I love about this. The mature, he says, will understand. It's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek way to say it, isn't it? Hey, listen, if you think you're mature, you think you're perfect, you think you've traveled far in Christ and made some good growth in your life, well then listen, you need to realize you still got far to go. And you need to realize that you put those past accomplishments behind you. You put those past failures behind you. You know, Christians can be tripped up by our past in a couple of ways, many ways, but two we would say today, one is by looking at the sins which God has already forgiven you for. God, uh, Christ has died for them on the cross of Calvary. And you simply need to restore your relationship with the Lord by confessing your sins to Him. You're not lost. You're not cast away. You need to move on in the Lord. But you can let your past failures weigh you down and keep you from serving Him. The other thing is you can let your past successes be like something that keeps you from serving God because you're just resting on the laurels of your own success. And you say, well, I've done what I need to do. No, listen, whatever season of life you're in, God's got a purpose for you. Now, some of the men in our church were sharing on the WhatsApp group about how God can still use and, and men and women can still be used even in the very late years of their life. It's absolutely true. So put the past behind you, press forward. That's a mark of maturity is to say that you're not yet mature in Christ where you need to be. Paul says the mature will understand that. He also goes on to say, and listen, God's going to help you to understand this. If you will willingly submit yourself to the word of God and to be led by the Lord, he's going to show you how you need to grow and how you need to change, how you're complete in Jesus Christ, but how this image of Jesus Christ, pursuing after him, pursuing after the person of Jesus Christ is the goal you ought to have. So as he says in conclusion here in these verses in verse 16, let us walk by the same rule, living together in the way that he had said in this great unity in Christ. And then he says as well, and let us mind the same thing. Did you notice how he began in chapter 3 and chapter 2? Paul had a passion that Christians would go on together in unity and in humility to serve the Lord. Part of this mature view of immaturity, forgetting our past and looking forward, is bound up with humility and unity. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if we all had this attitude, we would make a lot of progress in our walk with the Lord, wouldn't we? We'd have a lot of unity if we could go on in this way. Praise the Lord for Paul's good example in this way. Now, as Paul says this, he, he brings to mind this example that he's giving to the people. There's some examples to follow here. Verse 17, he says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us, for an example. Hey, listen, he's saying, follow after Paul in this, this desire to be humble and to be a great man or a great woman of the faith, and yet say, I still want to grow up in Christ. And praise God for the men and women in my life and the men and women in your life who are modeling Christ-like humility and service to God. And you ought to imitate them. By the way, friends, in depending on your culture, I think some cultures are better and worse about this. One thing I admire in many ways about Asian cultures is they often have a lot of respect for good teachers or for good leaders, but especially educators I'm thinking of. A lot of times in, in North America and, and Western countries, there can be more of a critical attitude, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But here Paul says, listen, when you meet a brother or a sister in Christ, they're wise in the things of the Lord. They're pursuing after the Lord. And you see their life that's been changed by the word of God. You ought to follow after them to not only look up to them, but also to imitate those things which are good which are things that they've been taught of the Lord. Now, you don't have to imitate everything about their mannerisms or their demeanor or, or all those nitty-gritty things, but as you see the mark of a changed life in them, friends, you ought to imitate them and try to be together with them. In fact, in our Sunday school lesson, we talked about avoiding people who are uh, just very selfish. And here we're talking about imitating people who are selfless as they pursue after the things of Christ. But that brings us to the bad examples. 
the sad examples, I would say. And friends, this is one of the reasons why I love this chapter, not because it makes me feel good, but because it makes me feel rebuked. And it shows me a way that I want to be very, very careful. So let's look at some sad examples that Paul is going to bring up here. And really, this is something that broke his heart. That's why I call it a sad example. Let's let's read down verses 18 and 19, and then we'll study them out. Verse 18, he says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. I don't know how, about you, friends, but I, I know uh, of people in my past who had uh, claimed to be Christians or who had said they were Christians and have turned against the things of the Lord and turned against the Lord himself. And I don't know all the details of all of their stories, but it's a tragedy when that happens. And I pray that it would never be once named among us at IBC. But here, these sad examples, notice what he says. He describes them. He says, they are enemies of the cross of Christ. They're traitors. They had turned away from following Christ, and now they even attacked the true gospel. They were doomed. He says, their end is destruction. If these people really turned away from the Lord, and there's no signs of repentance, and there's no, we could say, a chastening in their life, then that means that they were not saved. Now, it's hard for us as Christians, when you see somebody turning away from the Lord, We don't know their hearts. If there's chastening, if they're miserable, if they can't be happy, then maybe that person is a child of God who's turned away temporarily, but they're being chastened by God, and maybe God will bring them back to himself. But if there's a person who's absolutely turned away from the faith, and there's no change, no repentance, no conviction, things like that, then we're afraid, sadly, that they are doomed. He says as well, they're idolaters. Look at the strange way they have another God. It says, whose God is what? Is their belly. Now, friends, that's the whole Sunday school lesson there. What a powerful phrase to say their God is their belly. Now, that's the part I want to say challenges me. I want to ask if it challenges you. Are you the kind of person that is honestly serving yourself? not just your belly, but that means your appetites, your physical desires. Even Christians, are you the kind of person who, if we were honest, you you worship and you serve yourself more than God? That's, that's challenging, isn't it? To say that God to you is your belly. Wow, what a, what a rebuke. And then as well, this thing we see here, he says they're shameful. Their glory is in, in things that are shameful. They ought to be ashamed of. And then if they're to stand before the Lord of glory someday, will be nothing but a shame. They, they rejoice and they're happy about things that are shameful. And friends, I've got to tell you, the world today in 2021, there are plenty of things that are lauded and praised that are a shame according to the word of God. Things that are shameful and sinful behaviors. Now, You may be thinking of certain sins and particular sins, but you know what? The list of sins in the Bible is quite long, isn't it? Maybe you're thinking of those flamboyant things that are popular in societies today, like homosexuality, the transgender agenda. But I've got to tell you, friends, the Bible also says adultery is sinful. Fornication is sinful. Lust is sinful. Lying is sinful. Hatred is sinful. Pride is the thing that God hates, perhaps, most of all in these things. There are plenty of things that, yes, the world does, but sometimes Christians do, which they even glory in and are proud of, and it's an absolute shame to do those things to the God and in the eyes of God who sees us every day. And lastly, he says they're earthly. They mind earthly things. And again, that phrase, the phrase whose God is their belly, it kind of stabs me with conviction. And the phrase who mind earthly things, brothers and sisters in Christ, How often do you and I put our focus and our attention on earthly things? What a challenge. Now, yes, we've got to be good stewards of our life here on earth and the things that we do, our monies and our times and our talents. But you know what? You know what it is to be obsessed about earthly things instead of heavenly things. May God help us. Now, let me show you something as before we leave this, because I think it's so powerful. I believe that you can reverse this list. 
I believe that, that the way people come to be traitors to the cross of Christ, if they're unsaved, is by following these. And I believe that Christians, as they come to ruin their testimony for God and waste their life, is by following through these. Let me show you what I mean. If you go from the bottom all the way back up to the top as my arrow just bounced along, then this is what we see. If we begin in this way, earthly obsession, being fixated on the things of this life. Now listen, we said it in Sunday school, it can be good things. It can be harmless things. But if you let them have control in your life and you get obsessed with them, you mind earthly things. And that leads you to shameful delight. If you're obsessed with earthly things, you'll devote your life to things that are not of lasting value, and in many cases, to get involved with things that you ought not to be involved with as a Christian. And as you do this, this leads to worship of self and worship of selfish pleasures, to where in honesty, your belly is your God. You're an idolater, and the person you've put up on the shelf to, to idolize is yourself. What a tragedy. That leads to damnation or destruction. Now, I say this in this way, damnation or destruction. If you're listening to us for uh, the first time or you haven't listened, we've preached many times from other books of the Bible, including the book of Hebrews, to remind ourselves if you're a Christian and you turn away from the things of the Lord, you live in sin, you don't come back to the Lord, He will chasten you. And yes, the Bible says even to the point to where you are ill physically, and even to the point where God will take you out of this life and bring you on home because you're wasting your life here. It's a scary thing, and it's meant to shake you up and bring you back to repentance in God uh, and faith to walk with Him. Now, if you're not a believer, you're headed for destruction and damnation already. That's what Jesus Christ told Nicodemus as we shared the last several weeks. You need to trust Jesus Christ before it's too late. But you're traveling down this road from earthly obsession to shameful delight to worshiping just yourself, headed towards damnation, and it leads people to become enemies of the cross of Christ to where far from submitting yourself to God, far from admitting that you're a sinner, turning from your sins and trusting God as Savior, you despise the things of God. You hate the gospel. You think it's foolish and stupid. And you say you only live once, so you better live it up. And friends, you are headed to damnation. But Christians, here's what I want to beg you to see and remind myself. Don't begin where this begins. Don't start with an earthly obsession and letting your God be your belly. That's a huge challenge, brothers and sisters, because naturally we just care about ourselves. Naturally, we look out for number one. We obsess about our pleasures, our joys, our desires, and we go day by day with that. And that's a dangerous way to live. God desires for us to die to the flesh, as we talked about before and to pursue after Christ, as Paul has given us the great example. So don't follow after these tragic examples. Don't break the hearts of Christians around you. But more importantly, don't break the heart of the Lord and live in this way, rejecting Him and putting yourself in the place of worship. All right, as this finishes up, there's some expectations that Paul has. There's some reminders before we say goodbye to this chapter where Paul wants us to remember some things that will help us in this journey. Look in your Bible at verse 20. Uh, he, says, uh, he says here in chapter 3, verse 20, for our conversation, that doesn't mean just our speech, it means our lifestyle and everything about our real life is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a new life in Christ, and this brings expectation to us. We are looking for the return of Christ. I mean, think about the tragedy if you are minding earthly things, involved in shameful behaviors, worshiping your own belly and your own lusts and desires, and the Lord Jesus Christ appears. Christian friends, can you imagine the shame and embarrassment? Because your life was already supposed to be being lived as it would be lived before the Lord in perfect obedience and service, and yet here we are on earth, worshiping and serving ourselves. Let that not be the case when Christ comes. But listen, my true life is bound up with the Lord in heaven, and someday this veil of flesh 
and this valley of tears I will pass through and I will finally be with my Lord. He'll come for me or I'll go to be with him. And then I'll be living, we can say, my true life, which will last for eternity. Verse 21, there's a new future we have in Christ with this transformation. It says, who shall change our vile body. Now, the body we know from Paul in other places is something that can be good. It's something that we can enjoy the pleasures God has ordained for us to enjoy in the right ways. But also, you know what? Often we sin in our body, and this body comes to decay as time goes on. It doesn't do what it used to do. We don't enjoy it as we once did. Ecclesiastes, which we're studying on Fridays, reminds us of this, that you don't have the same pleasures at the end of your life as you did in the the middle and the beginning. Paul says God's going to change this vile body, and it's going to be fashioned like unto his glorious body. A great mystery here that God is going to glorify us and transform us, give us a new glorified physical body. And it says, according to the working, whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. He's going to transform us and change us. Now, friends, even though we are in this body for now, our lives ought to be transformed into the image of Christ's likeness. That's what Paul says. He says, I'm working hard so that I can apprehend that for which I am apprehended. I'd like to close it up in this way. Instead of chasing earthly desires, pursue after Christ. That's what Paul is teaching us today. That's what God the Holy Spirit wants us to know through these inspired words, is if you're a mature Christian or you're a maturing Christian, you're growing up in Christ, and God the Holy Spirit is speaking to you in conviction, stop just chasing earthly desires in this new year and pursue after the things of Christ. Think about the language we heard today. You've got a high calling in God. There's a reason he's got you here and something he wants you to do. Pursue after it. Pursue after being pleasing to the Lord. The likeness of Jesus Christ ought to be our goal and his presence is our destination. So instead of chasing earthly desires, pursue after Christ. His likeness is our goal. His presence is our destination someday. Praise God for this great example to us from Paul of how he lived his life. Praise God even for this tragic reminder of those who are worshiping themselves and serving their bellies. May God keep us from that path. And may God help us to be like runners in the race, pursuing the great prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Let's pray and ask God to help us. Father, we thank you so much for your inspired word today, which inspires us as well. We thank you that the Holy Spirit, Lord, led people like Paul to write these words. And Father, they really resonate with us as Christians. Father, we desire to do these things. We want to live and be this way. And yet, Father, in us, in our flesh, we are too weak and we are unable to do this. And so, Father, we rejoice as well that you say in this, even in this book, that, Father, you are both in us to will and to do your good pleasure. And so, Father, give us great grace. Give us great strength to do this. Help us to partner with you as we fight off and we kill the fleshly desires. And, Father, help us this year as Island Baptist Church members and friends to live for you and to pursue after your plan for us in Jesus Christ. We thank you that you've saved us. We thank you that we are safe in you. We thank you that we are complete in your son, Jesus Christ. But Father, we know we have so much farther to travel to be what you want us to be. And Father, we thank you that even after our traveling days are over, and even after this race is run, that Father, you will finish up that which is lacking in us that our sanctification will turn into glorification and we'll be able to stand in your presence in perfect safety, perfect beauty, dressed in the righteousness of your Son and glorified like unto him. Thank you for this, Lord, and help us to live up to this great high calling, we pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.